So, um, well, thank you so much, and that's really nice to see people here finally after two years. It's been quite a while, so it's good to see people finally, you know, joining, uh, you know, meeting in person and uh, and moving forward. <coughs> Everybody probably knows Tectalic um, from development of the base station and, and producing many of the carrier grade base stations. But in reality, uh, the last probably two years or so, we spent most of our time developing now solutions um, like end-to-end -end solutions and specifically focusing on the medical devices in addition to some other um, number of other devices we developed and, and providing you know, complete, uh, complete uh, applications with it that people can integrate them fairly easily. Um, when we look at the medical field, and probably everybody knows even before COVID, there was a big, um, there's a big concern that medical costs are skyrocketing and everywhere globally, and it's quite significant. Uh, people looking at means to reduce those costs and understand how we can do it, you know, do it intelligent way where we can reduce the cost, but without actually uh, uh, reducing the patient care and quality of service. Um, so what we have done, uh, especially really probably before COVID started, we approached a number of physicians in, in Calgary, in, in Canada, and actually across even in the US, and tried to understand what are the problems that really they want today, we can address some of the, you know, them. And what we realized that there's actually a, a large number of solutions already exist in many hospitals do have solutions today. Maybe I'll just go back for a second. Many hospitals do have today solutions like especially telemedicine and some of the very basic IoT solutions. However, they haven't been integrated into something that can provide a very, I would call it, um, um, a single point for a physician to understand the state of a person, right? Really what the, that particular patient, you know, feeling like. And so uh, what we realized talking to some of the physicians that there are really the five signs that physicians always will check on you, like to understand how you're, how you're doing. It doesn't matter if you go to a hospital, if you're just coming to see a physician in their practice, they always will check, first of all, your temperature, they'll check your heart rate. Um, then they will observe your respiratory rate because it's a very difficult one to measure and people change. If you tell people, I'm going to be checking your breathing, people will automatically change how fast they breathe, things like that. So it's really tricky. And it's only monitored when you have a surgery or if we have a recovery room, they actually do capnography. Um, then after that, they will probably check your SpO2, level of oxygen in your blood, and then they'll check your blood pressure. Having those five signs and knowing your age and you know, your kind of physical state, doctors really understand if there's a problem with you or not. So really, um, what we were told is, if you guys can solve these five problems, if you can actually measure those five signs and measure all the time and measure with the medical quality, there is definitely significant value to be done. Um, and what we've done, we actually built the first device called eDoctor, which I'm wearing right now, and we have actually a you know, number of people wearing him right now, and we have people who are already using them, and they perform very, very well. And the eDoctor does exactly that. I'll talk a little bit more in details, but what I've tried to point right away here is where the big costs are. Everybody always talks about, you know, monitoring patients in, in a nursing home, in, at the home, things like that. But reality is that some of the largest costs today are when you're dealing with the people that have, you know, very ill, let's say operations, people had some operations, and none of that you have to monitor them. And if you look at the numbers, they're really staggering. I mean, there's a 310 million major surgeries performed globally, 45 million of them are somewhat in the US and 20 million in Europe. And out of those, you know, 310 million major surgeries every year, about 30% of them, or let's say 100 million, will have significant costs. It means after the surgery, some people will pass away, they'll die. Some people actually will have complications and some people will be readmitted and it's about 15% of them or so will be readmitted and that's where the significant cost is. So what we're talking here is, is there a way to get feedback early on after the surgeries that these patients are not doing well? Because many times it's too late. It's actually people stay at home until they're realizing I need to go back to a hospital because I'm critically ill again. But if you could monitor those patients early on, you can actually avoid a lot of these costs. That's clearly number one. Number two, which is people don't talk today, and I'll go in the use case a little bit more, it's actually COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, 
I wasn't even aware that this is actually a real thing, but um, even though my wife is a physician, uh, but it's, a, it's apparently a third most common death today globally. And it doesn't really happen very often in North America because we don't have significant problem people who eat the smoke or with the quality of air, and it's particularly like, you know, dust in the air. But there are significant problems in the developing countries, and the number of people suffering from it is huge. And again, generally speaking, physicians don't realize this is a problem until it's a little bit too late. And at that point, you can't really cure people. You really, they're, you know, you, they have to kind of suffer and live through it. Um, it's not just significant you know, number of people who are dying from it. The bigger problem is it's a significant number of people who actually live with it and they can't really do, you can't really do anything to improve their quality of life. So when we really talk to, um, in, in, you know, spend more time talking to physicians and said, how can we help you really? What can we do to really make, maybe, you know, solve in any way problem? And I think the answer we got was very simple is, you, they looking at engineers and way to say, why don't you help us where we are spending a lot of our time today where we don't get really, where we can be more efficient. So the nurses on average will spend 30% of their time just checking on patients, checking those five vital signs that I mentioned before. And they go every one hour or every four hours, depending on protocol, depending actually what patients was, you know, why they're in a hospital, but it's a lot of their time. So 30% of the time nurses will spend just collecting data and then tabulating it per patient to making sure that the physician can look attentive, look and understand, does this patient have a problem or not? And we know we can do it much more efficiently with the devices I'm wearing right now. Um, the number two problem they said over and over is respiratory rate today is not monitored. It's actually misinformed most of the time. It's just observed. And I don't want to go into details, but the thing is that normal respiratory rate for a patient is between 12 to 20, like I'm speaking right now, probably 15, 16, something like that. When you have a surgery, they bring you down to about eight breaths per minute. When you go to six, you go blue, right? So you're between eight to 10, depending on your age and things like that. That's kind of bringing you down so you don't bleed. But when you go to six, so if you actually slow down, you go blue because you bring your brain trying to shut down. If you go about 20 and you're not exercising, there's something really wrong with you, you know? So in a hospital setting, when, they, when you come in and they observe you and they see you're maybe doing about 25, 30 breaths per minute, they'll generally put a, an oxygen mask on you because they know you're not going to stay alert for a long time. So it's a very good indicator, an indication that something potentially is wrong. And that's something they're looking today because that's a good indicator to know something potentially wrong with the patients. But what physicians and nurses said over and over, they said we need a simple, reliable, and we'll call it cost-effective solutions that can monitor patients all the time because observing them even four hours or so in the hospital setting is not enough if you see patients getting worse and worse. So that's really what's kind of our problem. Um, I'm not going to go into details why LoRaWAN is really good to address this problem because today there are many solutions that support Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and things like that, but reality is that they're not very great for propagation losses, so meaning you can't really cover large areas. And you can't really expect an 80-year-old wearing actually a device that talks to a smartphone that talks to something else. It really has to be completely autonomous. You put the device on, it doesn't have any buttons, it detects that it's actually on, and it just monitors, you know, vital signs. It has to be low power because you want to make sure that in a hospital setting, nobody is going to recharge smartwatches or something like that every two or five days. It has to run for months at a time. We want to make sure that this can use multiple users and work well in a, in a crowded environment, and it should work really, let's say, in a public network, in a private network. So if you're at home and you want to make sure you monitor yourself at home on a hospital enterprise, or you leave your house and you go outdoors, it has to really work everywhere. That's the idea here. And obviously, it has to be low cost. So LoRaWAN really fed that. So what we develop, I mean, we develop a device, and I forgot to really take it with me, but you can imagine I'm wearing right now, it's about 10 centimeters wide and two centimeters uh, maybe thick, and we have them in our booth. We call it eDoctor, the name might really change, but what, what it does, really, it monitors uh, today five, well, three out of five key signs. It monitors body temperature, it's really core body temperature. It monitors very accurately heart rate. It's all medical, medical grade, so it means it actually meets all the medical requirements. 
Um, so it measures the heart rate, it measures obviously respiratory rate, that was the, absolutely the key for us to get it right. Chest expansion, it will detect coughs, it will detect your activity factor, body position in three degree accuracy, and it will also tell you, let's say if you fell down, anything like that. So it really can observe a patient knowing exactly what happens when you sleep, when you walk, when you exercise all the time. And it will send this data in normal mode every five minutes to the network and in an urgent mode, let's say if you detect it, it will send it every one minute or so. The benefits of the e-doctors are such that it does provide 24 seven monitoring regardless where you are. The information is not fed to you as a user, the information fed to the, to the attentive doctor or let's say medical professional hospital or some other setting. They are the ones really who understand what, what the information to do with. Um, it's, it, they will the ones also who will set the different alarms and setting depending what your maybe age and category is, depending say if this person you know, falls, you know, if the breathing falls below 10 breaths per minute or about 25, they will get an alarm and they can actually come and check up on you or give you a call, things like that. It significantly, the view is it significantly is going to reduce the post-operative complications and cost and that's really number one use case for us today. Even though there are lots of use cases is for specifically for monitoring people at home and other settings, we can discuss it. But number one, what we're looking for is reducing the cost of, of medical services while you're in the hospital because they're horrendous from, from what we understand right now. Um, the other really use case, really good for that one is when, when doctors prescribe you a medicine, they don't really know how well it works and what effect of the medicine has on you. Now, if they can observe you two weeks before you take medicine and let's say maybe three to four weeks after you take new medicine, they understand if actually medicine helping you or not in many cases. Um, the beauty of this device is literally it has no buttons, it has nothing to configure, you'll put it on, you wake, you, 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 when you put it on, you effectively wake up the device, it starts sensing that it's being moved, right? Or detects the temperature and start transmitting data. There's nothing to do it really to configure it or not to configure it. And it runs by putting it away. It will send the packet say, I've been taken off. So somebody can remind you, you have to put it back on. Um, it can beep as well, things like that. I know my time is very critical here, so I don't want to spend too much time. The typical use cases for this are Hospitals, assisted living, aging at home, military and service, and military and, and firefighters. We have actually today, military was one of our use, first use cases, not so much for monitoring patients, but it's all about understanding how physically soldiers are when they're doing extra and exercises. It comes with a complete e doctor application. It can be run on a device, it can be run obviously in a cloud, it can be on premises, and it's fully integrated with the medical hospitals uh, systems through HS7. And then the new device we're developing, I don't want to spend too much time, is eBeat that is very similar, but it goes on an arm, much smaller device. And in addition to this science, it will also measure SpO2. And the idea is for SpO2, you need to understand in some cases level of oxygen. So if you really think about it, then we're already having four or five key signs. And the fifth one is really, that's kind of the most important is understanding can we do the blood pressure without the cuff, you know, cuffless blood pressure. If we can do that, then we can really monitor patients all the time and provide very accurate vital information to physicians. Um, the breeze sensor is part of medical package because it allows people that have potentially COPD to, to understand are they having problem breathing because it's potentially the quality of the air, the where they are, or it's related directly to their medical stress. Thank you.